Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to week two of our class. This is for uh, American government, Political Science 100. Uh, today, we start with a new section and a new chapter, uh, historical context for the creation of the U.S. Constitution. As you can see, uh, Roman numeral one says historical context for short. All right, so write it down. From 1777, 1774, my mistake, to 1787, the U.S. was governed by a document known as the Articles of Confederation. Articles of Confederation. Which leads us to ask this question, which is subpoint A. What is a confederation? What is a federation? What is a unitary form of government? What do these mean? These are forms of government. What do they mean? All right. Write it down. All three forms of government, confederation, federation, unitary, have a central government and lesser governments. Sometimes there are known as states, as in the United States and Germany. Sometimes they are known as provinces, as in Canada, and sometimes they are known as regions, as in Russia, okay? So all of them have this in common. There is a central government, and there are lesser units, okay? Good. Now, the main difference between them the main difference between them is in the distribution of power between the central government and the lesser governments. So here we go. What is the distribution of power in a confederation? Sub point one. In a confederation, the lesser governments, provinces, states, regions, have more power than the central government. That is a confederation. In a federation, the central government has more power than the lesser governments. So central government has more power in a federation. And finally, in a unitary form of government, all power resides in the center and the center, the central government, decides whether to delegate this power to lesser governments, to, to counties, to cities, etc., etc. So, examples of a confederation today would be the European Union, as an example of a confederation, 
an example of a federation today would be the United States, Canada, Germany, Russia. An example of a unitary system of government today would be France, Spain, the United Kingdom. Okay? Now, sub point four says relationship to democracy. And this is very, very important to know. Do not assume that because power is centralized in a unitary form of government, that that form of government is not democratic. That is a mistake. France is a unitary form of government and is democratic. By contrast, China is a unitary form of government and is not democratic. Spain is a unitary form of government and is democratic. Cuba is a unitary form of government and is not democratic per our definition of what democracy is, of course. Uh, same thing for a federation. The United States and Canada are federations and they are democratic. Russia is a federation and is not so democratic. Okay? In other words, either one of these three, confederation, federation, and unitary, can be democratic or undemocratic. It does not matter. Democracy can associate itself with any one of these three forms of government. Point B, confederation in the United States. As I said before, from 1774 to 1787, the United States was a confederation of states. It was not a federation of states. So, we ask this question, what powers did states have that the federal or central government, to be more accurate, did not have? Here we go. Number one. States had the power to print currency, had the power to print currency. Some states were deeply in debt, so they overprinted currency to reduce their debt load. Okay, when you do that, the value of the currency of that state drops, and that angers the financial elites of the country. Let me give you a hypothetical example. Uh, let's say I was a banker. And you came to me for a $1,000 loan, okay, to be paid next year plus interest. 
we're not going to discuss what the interest is going to be. Just say plus interest. During this one year, the government of California, remember we are under a confederation, decides to overprint its currency and cuts the value of the California currency in half. Hmm? Falls down in half. When you come back next year and you give me that $1,000 plus interest, what is it that you are giving me, actually? What is it that you are repaying me? Are you repaying me that $1,000? Or are you repaying me $500? The answer is you are repaying me $500. Because the value of the currency was cut in half. You are giving me $500 back plus interest. Do you understand how the value of a currency drops? Is this clear? All right. Next, number two on the list of powers that states had. States had the power to place tariffs on goods coming from another state. A tariff is what? A tariff is a tax on an import. So states had the power to put tariffs on each other's goods. If state A, let's say California and Nevada, if California puts a tariff on hay, H-A-Y, coming from Nevada, then Nevada will place a tariff on citrus products coming from California. Then California retaliates with more tariffs. Then Nevada retaliates with more tariffs. The end result of this escalating tariff exchange is a trade war where everyone loses, especially the large merchant class. And that is what happened during the Confederation. States used to engage in reciprocal, that's the word, reciprocal tariffing, which led to a trade war and ended up with merchants and consumers losing. If you recall, during the Trump years, Trump started a trade war with China um, tariffs on goods coming from China. China reciprocated with tariffs on goods coming from the United States. There was a trade war. Eventually, both countries came to their senses and they put a pause on it. They came to a some sort of an agreement because they knew if this 
form of trade war gets out of hand, it might lead to a hot war, an actual military conflict. So states had the power to put tariffs on goods coming from other states. Number three. Each state controlled its own militia. Each state controlled its own militia. There was no central army or central navy to protect the nation. Usually, if the United States wanted to go to war, it will ask states to volunteer their militias for the effort. Some states would, some states would not. And finally, number four, constitutional change. constitutional change. Changing the Articles of Confederation required the agreement among all 13 states. All of them should agree to change the Articles of Confederation which was the law of the land, all of them. And the ratification, meaning approving that change, must be carried in state legislatures. Okay? The state legislature should carry that constitutional change. Next up, we will talk about Shays' Rebellion. What was Shays' Rebellion? What was it all about? All right. Write it down. The cost of any war, be it the war for independence, be it the war in Vietnam, be it the US invasion of Iraq, be it the first US Gulf War with Iraq, the cost of any war is paid for by ordinary people, okay? Not the wealthy, not the well-connected, not the well-off. Usually the well-connected, the, the well-off, uh, get deferments they don't serve. Dick Cheney got deferments, Donald Trump, allegedly had bone spurs in his heels and allegedly couldn't serve. He got deferments, okay? So the cost of war is paid for by ordinary folks. The war for independence was paid for by the blood and the treasure of ordinary small farmers, not plantation owners, mind you, small farmers. The small farmers abandoned their farms 
and joined George Washington's army. Seven years later, when the war ended, they return to their farms and they find their farms in debt with courts about to foreclose on their farms. The farms were in debt. The farmers couldn't pay their taxes. The farms were derelict, falling apart. You know, that's what happens when you go to war and leave your small business behind. Daniel Shays, okay, was a veteran of the War for Independence. He, he refused to allow his farm to be foreclosed on. He and a bunch of other farmers went to the armory, picked up their muskets, because in a militia, they separated the muskets from the militiamen. So they went to the armory, picked up their muskets, and they marched down to the local courthouse in Springfield, Massachusetts, surrounded the courthouse, and burned the foreclosure documents. They burned the foreclosure documents. They basically were telling the state of Massachusetts we are not going to allow you to take our property. Even though it is in debt, even though it is us who volunteered to join George Washington's army. The governor of the state of Massachusetts calls on the militia to come and defeat Daniel Shays. But Daniel Shays and his fellow farmers are partly the militia and they end up defeating the militia. The governor calls on the central government, but the central government cannot help him because they have neither an army nor a navy. Remember, they had to rely on the voluntarism of other states when going to war. So, how was Daniel Shays defeated? So, in order to defeat Daniel Shays, the wealthy of Massachusetts raise a mercenary army. Today, in modern lingo, 
mercenary army is called in the U.S. military contractors. Okay? Military contractors that are paid by the Defense Department or the State Department to do operations overseas. They're not regular U.S. military. They are paid way more than that. And they are independent military contractors. So they raise a mercenary army and the mercenary army proceeds to defeat Captain Daniel Shays and his fellow revolutionary farmers. So, why am I telling you this story? This story has a meaning. It has lessons that should be learned from it. So number one, what did the the ruling class, the ruling elites learn from this? Number one, the people with property learned that you need a strong central government that does two important functions. Number one, put down rebellions, put down rebellions that are disruptive to the economic process. That's number one. And number two, protect property owners from non-property owners as James Madison, one of the founding fathers, once said. Okay? So these are the lessons learned by the elites of the United States from this rebellion. The second question is, what did the masses not learn, and they still haven't learned that, from this Daniel Shays episode? Well, the masses should have learned this. Never volunteer to fight in someone else's war. Okay? They never learned that. Um, In Vietnam, contrary to popular belief, two-thirds, two-thirds of those who fought in Vietnam were volunteers. I know there was a draft, but two-thirds volunteered to go to war. And they ended up paying the price with their blood and their treasure. And they had all kinds of ailments from the war. Same thing happened to those who volunteered during George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq. They were volunteers, and they went there, and 4,400 of them did not come back, and thousands of them were maimed, and a lot of them 
had mental issues in the form of PTSD. Same thing happened in the first Gulf War, the first one against Iraq, where uh, U.S. soldiers also volunteered and ended up coming back with a very nasty illness commonly known as Gulf War Syndrome whereupon a lot of them have died. So the masses never learned that. Of course, there are exigent circumstances. Some of them join to get the GI Bill, to get an education. Okay. Some of them join because they are highly patriotic. Some of them join because it's a family tradition. But a lot of them end up putting themselves in harm's way and getting hurt. So, Roman numeral number two, the Constitutional Convention. Here we go. You can see it on the lecture outline, Roman numeral number two. Write it down. Some researchers have argued that when the Founding Fathers met at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, they created a coup d'etat, coup d'etat. Now, coup d'etat is a French term which literally means chopping off the head of the state, coup d'etat. Now, let me give you a definition of what a coup d'etat is. A coup d'etat is an illegal, unconstitutional, transfer of power. It can be peaceful, it can be done peacefully, and it can be done violently <clears throat> through the military or through an armed militia. Uh, the recent events of January 6th 2021, where a bunch of Trump supporters attacked the Capitol, trying to find Mike Pence and hang him, and trying to find Nancy Pelosi and other members of the house and kill them after Trump gave a speech telling them to go down to the Capitol can be seen as a failed attempted coup d'etat. Trump wanted to stay in power he lost the election because he's a narcissist. He couldn't stomach losing the election. He made up this uh, big lie that there was massive fraud 
there wasn't. He lost almost 50 court cases where he tried through the court process to overturn the results, didn't work. He tried to pressure state officials to overturn the results, didn't work. He tried to get Mike Pence to overturn the results because he was the presiding officer over the counting of the results, didn't work. Finally, there was violence, okay? Some have argued that this can be interpreted as a failed attempted coup d'etat, an illegal attempt at a transfer of power. So, question is, is there evidence to support this thesis that what the Founding Fathers did at the Constitutional Convention was a coup d'etat, all right? Let's look at the evidence. Okay, so uh, this is a segment <clears throat> taken from your book called Conflict Over Ratification in Chapter 3. And in it, we find some evidence even though it's coached, it's, it's couched, sorry, in a um, some Orwellian language, we do find some evidence that this was indeed a coup d'etat. So let's read it. If you can pull up your book, read along. If not, just follow along with the section as I have it on the screen. So. Today, the U.S. Constitution is a revered document, but in the winter of 1787-88, the founders had real doubts about whether they could get it accepted as the supreme law of the land. Now, uh, keep in mind, the supreme law of the land at that time were the Articles of Confederation not the current Constitution. Indeed, the Constitution was ratified by only the narrowest of margins in the key states of Massachusetts, Virginia, and New York. The founders adopted a ratification procedure designed to enhance the Constitution's chances for acceptance. The ratification procedure written into the new constitution was a complete departure. I highlighted that because this is the Orwellian language that I was telling you about. A complete departure from what was then supposed to be the law of the land, the Articles of Confederation in two major ways. First, the Articles of Confederation required that amendments, meaning changes, to the Articles of Confederation be approved by all of the states, all of them. But since Rhode Island <clears throat> was firmly in the hands of small farmers, the founders knew that unanimous approval was unlikely. So they simply wrote into their new constitution that approval was required by only nine states. So now pay attention to this. All right? Here's where the illegality comes in. Here's where the coup d'etat comes in. All right. The Articles of Confederation required 
<clears throat> all 13 states to participate in constitutional change, to approve constitutional change. All of them, 13. That was the law of the land. Knowing that they would lose, the founding fathers only required nine states. Illegal, unconstitutional, a coup d'etat, or what your author would say, a complete departure from what was then the law of the land. So, first point of evidence that this was a coup d'etat, the Articles of Confederation, the law of the land, required all 13 states approve constitutional change. How many? All. Knowing that they would lose, the Founding Fathers only required 9 out of 13. Is this illegal? Yes. Was this unconstitutional? Yes. Was this peaceful? Yes. Was this a coup d'etat? Yes. Only the author of this book wants to call it complete departure. Got it? All right. Second, the founders called for special ratifying conventions in the states rather than risk submitting the Constitution to state legislature. Because the Constitution placed many prohibitions on the powers of states, the Founders believed that special constitutional ratifying conventions would be more likely to approve the document than would state legislatures. Yes, that is fine and dandy, but was it legal? Was it constitutional? The answer was no. So second point that this was a coup d'etat. The Articles of Confederation required ratification of constitutional change not only be unanimous, but be carried in state legislatures. Knowing that they would lose, the Founding Fathers simply said, hey, we're going to create special ratifying conventions that are friendly to our cause because we wanted to win. All right? Let's continue. Supporters of the new constitution, who became known as Federalists, enjoyed some important tactical advantages over the opposition. Now, I highlighted tactical advantages because here, too, the uh, author of the book is being Orwellian. He doesn't want to come out and say it, so he's hinting at it using different language. First, the Constitutional Convention was held in secret. Potential opponents did not know what was coming out of it. Guess what else is held in secret? A coup d'etat. All right? So, write it down. Point number three, that this was a coup d'etat. The founding fathers met in Philadelphia in a mansion in secret. They blacked out the windows of the mansion to prevent the opposition from knowing what they were up to. They even collected all the notes from the convention and destroyed them. But one person who was supposed to destroy his notes didn't. Who was that person? Well, that person was James Madison. And we now have his notes. And we can read what the founding fathers were up to. 
So if you want to read them, they're available online. Just Google Constitutional Convention Notes James Madison. Okay? Fourth point that this was a coup d'etat. Second, the Federalists called for ratifying conventions to be held as quickly as possible so that the opposition could not get itself organized. Many state conventions met during the winter months, so it was difficult for some rural opponents of the Constitution to get to their county seats in order to vote. Final point that this was a coup d'etat. Number four. Just like a coup d'etat, the founding fathers held the friendly ratifying conventions as quickly as possible and sometimes during winter in order to prevent the opposition from organizing. Is this clear? Do you understand this? Now, tactical advantages is an Orwellian language. You know, it's like a student uh, gets caught in my classroom re uh, cheating on the exam. And then that student uh, comes to me and says, Hey, Naji, I was not cheating. I was simply using my tactical advantages. Whereupon I would give him a zero or her a zero and get them out of the class. Is this clear? Do you understand this? All right. Point B, uh, theory behind the Constitution. Now, uh, there is a statement that I would say every now and then, and that statement is, find out on your own. When I say find out on your own, it means two things. It means it is in the book, Read it on your own. And more importantly, it means it will be on your exam. So you better read it on your own. So here we go. Find out on your own the following. Number one, who was John Locke? Who was John Locke? Number two, what was the social contract? Number three, what are natural rights? Natural rights. And number four, what is limited government? What is limited government? Okay, so find that on your own. I'm not going to cover it. It's in your book. It will be on your exam. Okay. Uh, who were the founding fathers? That's point C. Who were they? Hold on a second. I'm getting a call. I'm going to pause this for a minute. Okay, so that's what happens when you uh, don't put your uh, phone on Do Not Disturb and you get a phone call in the middle of a lecture. 
lesson learned. All right, so who were the founding fathers? Uh, where did they come from? What is their background? Uh, 55 delegates from 12 states showed up in Philadelphia. Uh, the one state that did not show up was Rhode Island. Now, given that the Articles of Confederation said, oh, you have to have all 13 states present, uh, what should the Founding Fathers have done? Well, they should have either postponed the convention or went out to Rhode Island and said, why don't you come, entice them to come, this way they can do things the legal way. But no, they didn't care, they pressed forward. All right. Uh, what were the demographics of those who attended? Here we go. They were men. No women were invited. They were men. They were white. No minorities were present. They were wealthy. They were well educated and had professions in banking, commerce, land ownership, slave ownership, and trade, okay? So they were pretty much the elites of their time. They had extensive government experience, extensive government experience. They believed that the Articles of Confederation do not work and a new constitution must be written. In that sense, they didn't do what they were asked to do. They were asked to do is modify the Articles of Confederation. They believed in a strong central government that can put down rebellions and protect a property owners from non-property owners. And finally, they did not trust the masses. Here is what some of these conventioneers referred to the masses as. One of the people at the convention referred to them as reptiles. Interesting. Another referred to them as a great beast. A third referred to them as the grating, the grazing multitude. Another referred to them as the great herd of mankind. Here's another one. The people do not want virtue, but are the dupes of pretended patriots. Okay, so uh, the masses, according to that person, easily fall for demagogues. 
very easy for them to fall prey to demagogues. Here's another one. The people are uninformed and would be misled by a few designing men. The masses are very easy to mislead by a demagogue, is what he's saying. So this is the view of the founding fathers about the masses. They did not trust them. They did not want them to have massive amounts of power. All right. We have come to the end of yet another lecture. And on this note, I will say bye-bye. <laughs>